minute to go. What do you got? I'm trying to watch that. 859. Is it tied to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can somebody remind me the name of our website for the uh, for the meeting? Prime Gov. Prime Gov. Prime Gov. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um. Okay, so, so Mr. Chairman, I think we're still um, uh, waiting on Trustee Cooper and Trustee McElhaney. Both have confirmed attendance at today's meeting. So just so you know. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. looks like Trustee McElhaney and uh, both are online. Now. All right. And I will call our May meeting of Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority to order. Before we get started, I guess there's a few comments on the on the, meeting that if the teleconference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting will be stopped and reconvened once the audio correction is restored. If I'm able to do it in 15 minutes, the remaining items will be considered at the next meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item or residents be heard, uh, please call the, the, uh, the number, uh, area code 405-297-2484. So I think we're ready to get started. I don't have, that's the only items I have. <clears throat> I understand we do have a residence to be heard, a Jeremy Moses. <clears throat> yes, we do, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I believe he is on the line. And Lisa is um, ready to, I believe, turn it over to him. If Okay, he should have his mic open. Mr. Moses, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning, All Jeremy. Right. If you would, repeat your name and your address. Sure. Jeremy Moses, 12205 Southwestern Avenue, apartment 1212-73170. Uh, the reason I'm here this morning is because I wanted to speak on the recent lifting of the capacity restriction. As I'm sure the trust is aware, as of, I believe it was Sunday, the capacity restriction has been modified to allow four people to stand on the fixed wrap buses. However, I feel that we targeted this in the wrong direction. Too many times over the last couple months, especially, I have been on a bus, the Route 40, South Walker, trying to get to a doctor's appointment. And because we are restricted to one wheelchair per bus, we've had to leave people behind. I feel this is, quite frankly, unreasonable. I mean, I, I plan ahead. I, I do. But not everybody has that ability. As a matter of fact, I have to go to an appointment this morning, and I'm going to be leaving at least a half hour before I actually should be leaving today so that I can make it. But not everybody is able to do that. There are people out there that have to rely on pre-CA, personal care assistance, and they get to the bus stop. There's already a wheelchair on board. They're forced to wait for the alternate uh, transport, which, as I understand it, and in fact, I've been on this in the past, they send somebody out in a, uh, in a paratransit van. Well, you could run into a situation where that makes the person wait for, the appoint for their appointment, and not every doctor's office is going to be reasonable. So in summary, I do feel that we, while this is a step in the right direction, and I understand this is being revisited every couple of weeks, I feel like we targeted the initial capacity change wrongly. We should have been targeting our ADA customers. Thank you very much. I might ask staff, how many wheelchairs can, can one of our buses accommodate? 
Uh, fixed route bus can typically accommodate, um, you know, generally at least uh, two, um, depending on um, whether there's a Q strength device on there or not, um, which I think most, most if not all, have um, the Q strength devices on them now. Um, uh, the Embark Plus vans will accommodate more, but we're still we still have capacity constraints to one um, mobility device on the Embark Plus. We we did we did expand capacity on Embark Plus, but still limited it to one mobility device. And and we are, I mean, we uh, we. We understand um, exactly what Mr. Moses is um, conveying to the trust. Um, we do, uh, our operators do um, let operations know if we have an individual in a mobility device that uh, is unable to board the fixed route bus and we, we do make alternate arrangements. But again, to Mr. Moses' point, it may not be as timely, right? Because we have to dispatch somebody to, to make that trip. Um, and then I guess finally, um, we are going to be looking at it every, you know, this uh, capacity. Uh, get some feedback. There might be from Mr. Moses. I think it might be your your phone if you don't mind muting. There we go. But then also, um, we are going to be looking at, um, you know, our capacity about every two weeks as we convey to the trust, um, and hopefully incrementally increasing. All right. Does that uh, response help you a little, Jeremy? Lisa, would you unmute Jeremy, please? Jeremy, thanks a lot um, for being a customer. And um, you always have a uh, good perspective for okay. us as staff. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, that, that response makes sense. I, I, like I said, I understand that we're looking at this every two weeks. I just... Like I said, I feel like we targeted people who are able to stand able to stand aboard the buses uh, first. When I would think we are able to distance uh, people who are in wheelchairs and mobility aids better, given that the wheelchairs have fixed uh, locations. So, if, so Mr. Chairman, since you, you asked for staff to comment, a follow-up on that then will be as a result of this feedback and in our initial, our initial review or analysis of how our capacity constraints um, are going, um, we'll, we'll, that's absolutely the, one of the first things we'll look at. I mean, we'll uh, see if we can't increase the, um, the mobility device uh, number on the, on the fixed route buses. All right, thank you. And thank you for your comments, Mr. Moses. And I'm sure the staff will take it under consideration and, and try to correct the, the issue that you brought up. All right, uh, moving on, approval of our minutes of April 2nd. Any of the trustees have any corrections or additions or deletions to the minutes? If not, I'd have a motion to approve our minutes. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify aye. All right, motion passes. The consent docket items A through H. It's your chairman. We don't have everyone voted yet. It doesn't, my screen just comes up blank, like nothing comes up. And then <clears throat> at the start of the meeting, um, I'm wondering if this was also, well, anyway, it, it just, um, it was just blank at first. Like when Jason was making the comment about me not being here yet, like I was, it was just like not showing me hmm. everyone else on the screen, just one person at a time. And then we were in. So anyway, just saying technology. Yeah, I didn't get an option to vote on PrimeGov. Okay, so can we have uh, Mr. Ruiz, uh, Mr. Cooper, and Mr. Sumner vote verbally? Aye, Robert. Aye, Barney. Uh, yeah, aye, James. Okay, all right, thank you. So we do, the motion does carry. 
on the consent docket, items A through H pertain to kind of the same issue. And I've asked Jason to just give us a, a brief comment on items A through H. And then if any of the trustees have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Yeah, it's kind of that time of year for um, uh, many of our um, annual renewals with our contractors um, that provide transportation services through our mobility management programs, um, specifically um, our senior services. So um, I know, you know, if you're not as familiar with all of these vendors and um, services as we as staff are, you look at the agenda and it, it almost looks repetitive because you have uh, vendors listed multiple times um, associated with different services we provide. Um, so just wanted to let you know that items A through H um, are basically a series of contract renewals with the exception being H. That's actually an amendment to an existing contract that we'll bring back for renewal, uh, I believe in June. Um, but basically these are agreements with our contracted transportation providers community action Cinderide, um, Harris Senior Citizens, and then um, the new uh, Yellow Cab. So we enter into agreements um, with these transportation providers, and then they help us actually deliver the transportation services, again, mainly through our senior services that we offer, such as um, our congregate meal program, um, our senior uh, shopping trips that we uh, provide, um, RSVP, the Retired Senior Volunteer Program, where seniors actually provide transportation for other seniors, uh, the Embark Well Program, Share Affair, and then um, Senior Companion. Um, so again, that's just kind of a summary of all of those items A through H that will allow those services to continue um, throughout the next fiscal year. And again, it's pretty typical. We bring them to you before the fiscal year expires um, so we can have those agreements in place. You'll notice also the funding sources are pretty uh, consistent. Uh, most all of those services are funded through um, area-wide aging agency, along with the uh, donations from the, from the customers. Uh, the exception would be uh, some operating funds going to support the Embark Well program. But I know um, I know you guys are familiar with with the program, the programs themselves, as you've heard from Marilyn Dillon uh, multiple times, our mobility uh, management manager um, on the specifics. So happy to answer any other questions. All right, uh, Jason, you might just mention item A, you know, to kind of clarify that. I mean, item L, excuse me. Oh, item L. All righty. Oh yeah, great. So this is uh, this is also really an annual, we've, we've kind of got in the habit anyway of making this an annual agreement. Um, so as you know, uh, when we have uh, large capital projects that qualify for the 1% public art program, if you will, um, we uh, rely on uh, Robbie, Robbie Kinzel and her staff and the planning department to really help us you know, determine, you know, what kind of public art is appropriate, how to select an artist. She and her team organize um, the selection committee. They basically manage that whole art process for us when we incorporate art into capital projects. And the best example of that is the uh, recent art that was installed on the convention center parking garage. You know, she, the planning department and, and Robbie and her team, they give us all that guidance. Um, we do end up uh, paying. Um, it's kind of based on, you know, the size of the project. Um, and again, might be a good time to recognize um, uh, Vice Chairman Sepner for serving on that latest committee for uh, public arts. So and I know uh, um, Trustee Hill has served on that committee for public arts. So they, they are certainly familiar with how it works. But this will just put that contract in place. Um, so that if we have a capital project in the coming year that requires 1% art, we have, um, we have the agreement ready to go. We may or may not obligate any funds. It just depends on our capital projects. All right, thank you. Uh, any of the trustees have any questions on our consent docket? If not, I'd have a motion to approve our consent docket. 
It's been moved and seconded. Can everybody vote now on Prime Gov? Yes, I'm seeing it. All right, motion carries, thank you. Items for individual consideration, item A is an agreement with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation for surface transportation block grant paratransit vehicle project. And it's for the purchase of, a pa of paratransit vehicles grant funds in the amount of 748,000. Jason, if you'd just like to clarify yes, that. Yeah, I know we have a lot of items for individuals, so I'll try to make my comments brief. And Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I talk about A and B together, just oh. because they're kind of two uh, new, newer grant programs, if that'd be all right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I wanted to, items A and B, um, I wanted to recognize um, staff for really continuing to look for new grant opportunities to fund uh bus replacement. You know, we have our formula funds that come in regularly. Um, generally, the amount that we're guaranteed to get from the FTA will replace about a bus and a half per year, not near enough to keep up with bus replacement. Um, so um, these two items here are grants that we don't typically receive for bus replacement, but again, uh, credit to staff for um, working through uh, the competitive selection process. So both of these grants are competitive. Um, and I'll just start with uh, talking about the first grant here on item A. So this is actually an agreement with ODOT for surface transportation block grant funds that, you know, typically and the majority of those funds go to um, roads and bridges, but we've been successful the last few years competing for those funds and um, having some of them allocated to transit specifically for bus replacement and transit projects. Um, and so again, something we typically, it's not typically a funding source we count on, but in this case, we have been successful in, um, in um, securing a, a STBG grant. Also wanna make sure to mention ACOG, our partners at ACOG a couple of years ago, they helped us um, or we assisted, we participated in, um, kind of really looking at the, the scoring or the evaluation criteria and with some of those changes that made transit projects uh, more competitive. So with that, um, we'll be receiving um, as part of this agreement $747,000 of uh, STBG funds to put towards the uh, purchase of replacement buses and we're looking to replace paratransit buses with these grant funds. When you put on the local match on top of the 747,000 in grant funds, we've got about a million dollar project here for bus replacement. Hopefully we'll be able to buy, um, you know, anywhere from six to eight pair of transit vans. Um, we're hope, you know, optimistic on eight, but the prices do continue to increase. So um, we'll bring back an item to the trust when we actually make the bus purchase and you'll know the exact amount and quantity of vehicles that we're purchasing. Um, and then item B, again, uh, this is kind of a, a one-off or an outlier. We typically don't receive grants from the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, but in this case, um, we, we worked with uh, that agency, competed in a uh, grant program that they managed as a way to disperse funds the state had re received through the VW settlement. I won't go into the details of the VW settlement, but happy to maybe talk with any trustees offline that uh, want to know more about that, if that's acceptable. Um, but essentially, um, we were able to uh, compete and receive uh, just under $500,000 um, from uh, this grant program, again, to put towards the purchase of replacement buses. In this case, we hope to be able to replace uh, two paratransit vans, one fixed route bus. Um, as part of the Grant, uh, the grant uh, will only fund 75% uh, of the cost, um, or I guess I should say we're actually maxed out at the 499000 if the cost exceeds um, um, the 25% local we had originally anticipated. Um, we'll, we will, you know, probably have to match more in order to maintain like the requirements of the grant, which is essentially that we replace three buses. Because the whole idea of this, this money 
is to get diesel buses off the road and replace them with cleaner burning technology. So we are obligated to purchase three buses really regardless of cost with this, with this grant. All right, thank you. Any questions by any of the trustees? Then I'd have a motion to approve item A. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Nobody's there. It is. Motion passes. Thank you. And then item B. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Item C is amendment number one to a professional services agreement with Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates to amend their scope of service uh, to include assessment and a conceptual master plan. Jason. Yes, with this with this item, we're asking the trust to authorize fifty six thousand um, additional dollars for this contract. Um, as you know, um, Nelson Nygaard is um, um, in the process of of conducting our comprehensive operational analysis, um, which is kind of sets the stage for the future of our bus system. They have subcontracted with HNTB, which is also our contractor, our prime co our prime A and E contractor for the BRT project. So what we wanted to do is take advantage of um, really uh, uh, this contract and these projects that are kind of occurring simultaneously and set a master plan together for our facilities. You know, with the, we know uh, with the um, additional BRTs contemplated in MAPS 4, um, with any additional frequency enhancements that might come in years ahead with recommendations from the comprehensive operational analysis, that we are quite frankly out of room here at South May uh, for additional people and additional equipment. And so again, uh, commending the trust and, and thanking the trust for allowing us to, op to um, exercise an options contract to purchase some land to the south of our facility here. And so um, it's, we, we, we're kind of in a position, we have the, the real estate to grow, but um, what this, uh, what we're really asking to do with this master plan is help us figure out how to sequence and um, understand what, generally understand what our facility needs will be. And specifically with the South May administration building, um, all of you have been over here um, and you know we have plans to remodel this facility, do a space plan. We want to make sure whatever we do now in the interim to the South May admin building won't be, you know, cost prohibitive or something we wish we wouldn't have done as we grow in the future years. So this master plan will really help us make the best decisions and allocate resources in the most efficient way moving ahead as we, for example, remodel the South May facility or we build a facility across the street or we relocate our bus wash. So it really will just set us up uh, in the future for facility needs and planning. All right, thank you. Any questions? And we have a motion to approve item C. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Mr. Chairman, apologies in advance for the long title on the next item. Well, I was going to, I was going to kind of paraphrase that. Okay. It, 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 it amounts to awarding the contract for an approval for bus stop refuge collection, removal, and disposal, estimated annual cost of thirty thousand. Exactly. It's authorizing the administrator to negotiate with the lowest bidder. Yes. Um, so I think I've, I think I've actually had an opportunity to talk to most trustees about this item, but yeah, um, just in quick summary, um, you know, we understand that uh, keeping up with um, emptying the trash receptacles at our bus shelters is becoming a bigger and bigger job because we keep adding more and more shelters, which is a good thing, right? Um, as you'll remember, last year alone, we added 100 additional covered bus shelters with trash receptacles to our system. Um, and ideally, our, our customers are uh, 
uh, enjoying um, those shelters and it's improving the customer experience, but it creates more work for us. And we want to try to keep up with uh, emptying the trash at bus shelters. So um, we went out for bids. Bids were way too high. We rejected the bids. And here we are now um, looking at two things, and you'll learn about this in the finance committee and through the budget propose, budget process. Um, we're proposing an in-house um, uh, bus stop cleaning program. So in-house meaning we'll use Embark staff to do that. There's some advantages to that in terms of our ability to, to you know, have more control. And then certainly we did a, not to get into the details, but we did analyze the cost compared to the bids we received from the private sector. So um, the long-term plan or the coming plan is to really manage most of that in-house. What this contract will allow us to do for 30,000 annually is begin some of that trash collection now through the, through, the, through the remainder of this fiscal year. So we're not waiting you know, to, to deal with the problem. And then secondly, we'll be able to leverage this contract moving forward even when we have our own in-house staff, we'll have a contractor on call. So if we have a problem area or we need some help, um, you know, in a particular week, we'll have a contractor, you know, that, that we can call on an as-needed basis. So again, um, estimated annual cost, 30000 annually, and we're looking to fund this out of just our normal uh, transit operating budget. I'm just curious, Jason, is there is there plans for like an operator if he sees a, a particular trash receptacle go overflowing that as he goes by it or stops, he can report it? Yeah, we, we actually encourage our operators to report anything that they see out of ordinary at a bus stop, um, whether it be a, you know, a damaged bus stop pole, damaged bus shelter, um, certainly if there's a trash issue. Um, and we rely on them heavily. Um, and they really do a great job about um, letting us know what's going on, going on out in the field. Okay. Thank you. Is Any that questions? Also, listen, is that also for like residents where they can like report to the action center? Mm -hmm. or, okay. Well, actually, I mean, they can report to the action center and then the information makes it our way. The most efficient way for customers to report is um, just to use the Embark app. Um, there's actually a selection there to report a bus stop issue. So they can report trash, broken bench, you know, anything they, they want to let us know about. Thank you. Right. No other questions? I'd have a motion to approve the item. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, two more items on our docket for uh, this is item E is a lease agreement with the city of Oklahoma City to manage the parking operations and maintenance of Scissor Hill Park surface lot estimated revenue of $100,000. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Lisa, can if I could ask staff, um, it looked like uh, Trustee Hill's vote didn't go through on the last one on my screen. Maybe it was delayed, but I saw a lot of green dots except next to Trustee Bryant and Trustee Hill's name. Did, did we ever get a vote for Trustee Hill? Hi, Jason. I am not looking at that screen right now. Uh, Tisha is, but we'll verify. And if it's not, we can correct it. Okay. So Hill, just to verify verbally, Hill, you did I did vote and I voted yes. So it showed, okay, thank it showed, up, you. showed up okay on my screen. Okay, my, my apologies. I just happened to see it was blank. So just checking. All right. Appreciate All right, it. So, so yes, the uh, so this item is um, again, a lease agreement between the city and COTPA. Uh, we've talked about this in uh, parking committee meetings and, and other opportunities, but this really formalizes just that handoff mm -hmm. of you, if you will, of the 500 space, or I believe it's 497 space parking lot just south of the convention center that was built as part of the convention center project. This is kind of that official handoff saying, you know, the city owns it, COPPA will operate it, and COPPA will retain the revenue that is generated from that parking lot. Um, and we actually opened that surface lot to the public uh, last weekend. Um, we took 
possession of it, if you will, um, on May 1st. And um, just for anybody that's listening or if you get questions um, about parking in downtown, um, we now have a, a 500 space uh, surface lot operational for visitors to Scissor Tail Park, the convention center, basically kind of anywhere in that area, anybody going to the Chesapeake and so forth. Okay, thank you. Any questions? If not, I'd have a motion to approve item E. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Uh, well, we have a motion, but Brent and Steve, I guess the same issue. Well, Steve's voted. My my screen shows Steve voted. Okay, I yeah, did saw it at that then. time. Yeah. All right. Motion passes. The last item is item F, and that's a request for proposals for bus procurement to procure nine buses for the new bus rapid transit system. And I think Jesse's going to uh, review this item and uh, plus a little update on the BRT. Yep, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I'll review the item real quick and then I'll share my screen and go through a presentation. So this item is a request for proposals to uh, essentially put out a proposal for uh, bus manufacturers to submit their proposals to uh, construct and build and uh, provide nine CNG buses uh, for our Northwest BRT project. Um, it's a competitive bid, so we expect to get several bids uh, in for the project, and then we will bring those to the committee to review and then to the board to uh, approve. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Everybody see that? Not yet. Okay. How about now? All right. We see it now. Or I do. Okay. All right. Yes. Great. So part of this uh, procurement is uh, this schedule here. So I'll walk through the schedule real quick. So you know, today uh, we're bringing the RFP to the Copper Board for approval. Uh, once it's approved, it'll be advertised on May 12th. And then those submittal deadlines are due back to us by June 16th. And we'll be bringing a recommendation back to the board on August 6th. And then uh, once the board approves that contract, the, the manufacturer will go into the manufacturing process. And then um, within eight months of that contract approval, we are expecting our first bus to be delivered uh, to our facilities here at South May. And then uh, 18 months after that contract approval, we anticipate having all of our buses here at South May. So now I'm gonna kind of walk through the, the process a little bit of, of what happens during construction and some of the things that we do to uh, make sure that they're meeting our standards. So one of the things we do is uh, we contract with a company called TRC Companies who performs our FTA uh, Buy America pre and post inspections. So essentially what they're doing is they're going in and making sure that uh, the bus manufacturer is meeting the FTA's requirements for Buy America and making sure that our steel manufacturers are coming from um, uh, American companies. And on the right of the slide here is just a, a real quick snippet of kind of the checklist that they do whenever uh, they're doing some of the inspections. So you can see there, you know, they make sure that the, the frame is washed correctly, uh, sandblasted correctly, prime and sealed, and then all the way up through the paint process. Uh, again, this is just a, a quick snippet of some of the things that they inspect. You know, they're obviously inspecting all the wiring harnesses, glass. One of the cool things that they do that I, I think is kind of fun to see is once the, the exterior of the bus is built, they run it through uh, a <coughs> giant warehouse that just has spray nozzles spraying at uh, high capacity at all times. And then they're, they're checking the bus to make sure that there's no leaks. So you, you want a, a sealed tight bus, that's for sure. So that's one of the things that we do that, to make sure that the buses are meeting our criteria. 
And I'm going to walk through a few slides of uh, what the bus looks like as it's going through uh, the process. These slides are um, of our buses that are arriving that you guys uh, approved recently. So we've got eight buses that are coming in and they're from New Flyer. Again, this is a competitive bid process, but these, these pictures here are from the New Flyer uh, uh, facility. So this picture here shows you know, the, the framing process where they're doing the exterior framing. And they're also putting in the, uh, the interior metal panels and sealing those up. And this slide here is uh, the other side of the bus, same thing, interior panels being installed and, and getting those sealed up. And this one here shows the exterior uh, being installed and that fiberglass uh, front being put on. So it, it's kind of kind of weird looking, right? So it, there where the windshield would be, it's just got fiberglass there. So that's just to make sure that the bus stays structurally sound as they're uh, building it. And then that uh, centerpiece there gets cut out and glass gets installed. Then this is a picture of the rear of the bus where the, the exterior lights and the motor will be going. And then this picture here shows, um, you know, once the bus has been painted, and then it's ready for the motor to be installed and the CNG equipment to be installed. And then, then the buses start arriving. So this is a picture of our uh, buses that are coming in from New Flyer, uh, sitting on our lot, getting ready for the, the wraps and stickers and the final IT equipment to be installed. Any questions on the bus procurement? Jesse, how are these buses gonna be different than the buses uh, that we use on our fixed route system? Yeah, great question. So uh, the BRT buses are gonna be set up to uh, for the interior. So we're gonna um, kind of set those up more coach style. So they're gonna have high back seats, um, armrests, those types of things, uh, a, a much higher quality, higher, higher end interior. Um, on the exterior, uh, one of our requirements by the FTA is that they have to be uh, specifically branded for the BRT. So the exterior will look different than our, our current fleet. Um, and then one pretty cool uh, aspect of the BRT buses is that, you know, you've got, you've got that front door where most uh, uh, customers will board. Well, with the BRT, because we're going to have our ticket vending machine on the platforms, our rear door is actually a little bit wider that will allow for boarding and alighting also. So it just kind of speeds up that whole process of, of customers being able to board and alight the buses. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, great question. Any other questions on bus procurement? Okay. Go ahead and move into the BRT update real quick. So, you know, a few months back, we uh, HNTB presented to the board um, where we were currently with the engineering. I wanted to give a quick update of kind of where we are as far as engineering, but also some of the things that we're doing to make sure that uh, our customers along the alignment uh, know what's going on. So one of the things that we did was we, uh, we stood up our Northwest BRT stakeholder work group. Uh, several from the board are on that work group also, um, but it uh, compromises representatives from our neighborhoods and businesses along the corridor, allows them to, to provide comments that um, things that they're hearing out uh, along the corridor about the BRT and, and public transit and they bring those to, the, to this stakeholder work group. And it's also an opportunity for us to really strengthen the alliance between public transit and uh, our community, right? So it gives us an opportunity to explain what we're doing uh, with public transit and the BRT. And then those representatives can go back to their uh, specific areas and, and pass on that information. So this, uh, this here is a quick overview of the members of that uh, uh, stakeholder work group. Mr. Sipner's on there, Councilperson and Trustee Cooper's on there. And then, you know, we, we kind of reached out to, uh, like I said, representatives and from the neighborhood. So we've got, you know, Cassie Poor with the Alliance of Economic Development. Uh, also, Trustee Ruiz is on there. Um, Jane Jenkins with DOKC. Uh, we've got Toon representing the Asian District. Uh, Kim Wells with the Chamber. So really kind of a, a, a good mix of everybody from the, from the area being on that stakeholder work group. And then we've got uh, Kristen Torkelson, right? So it's similar to like with the streetcar project, we've, um, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a representative from Embark going out and meeting with um, our community um, uh, members. So she, similar to like she's done with the streetcar, she goes out and she's meeting with our community members and neighborhood alliances. 
Um, but we wanted to make sure there was a single point of contact for uh, those members to be able to, to get a hold of someone. And so here's Kristen's contact information. Make sure you, you take it down in case you want to talk to her also. But real quick, so kind of the things that she does. So, you know, during the engineering process, which is going to take us all the way through uh, March of next year, she's going to be meeting with those property and business owners along the corridor, uh, providing the details and the updates of uh, where the project is. And then, like I said, also meeting with the, the local neighborhood groups, so that, like neighborhood alliances. Anytime there's a, a neighborhood um, uh, outreach or a neighborhood meeting, she goes to those and uh, is able to present or provide updates to, to those neighborhood groups. Then once we move into construction, just like we did with streetcars, so she's going to um, reach out. She's developing this giant list of everyone that's along the corridor. And she'll be reaching out to everybody, asking them if they want to sign up for her uh, weekly newsletter that essentially gives uh, construction updates of where the construction uh, project is along the corridor and what they can expect and how long they can expect those construction work zones to, to be around their area. And then she keeps up with her uh, same tasks that she does during the engineering, you know, meeting with the property and business owners along the corridor and going to those neighborhood groups. So a huge asset here. We're excited to, to have Kristen out there doing what she does best and, and really connecting with all the uh, the people along the corridor. Uh, speaking of Kristen, so just a, a quick shout out. She was also uh, awarded uh, Oklahoma City's 50 most powerful young professionals. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure we give that shout out to her and congratulate her for that. But she is also in good company because our very own trustee and council person Cooper is also on that uh, 50 most powerful young professionals. So also a shout out to trustee Cooper. All right, moving along. So uh, in, Embark and HNTB held our uh, virtual town hall meeting for the Northwest BRT to help educate and inform our customers about the, the project. Um, so we held two virtual town halls. So we had one at uh, 12, uh, 12 noon, and we had another one at 5.30 p.m. till 6.30, it, you know, really kind of splitting that up to make sure we gave every opportunity for someone to be able to call in and, and ask questions. You can see here uh, our new one had 56 uh, uh, customers in attendance and we received 15 questions. And then our uh, evening one had 22 in attendance with 14 um, uh, questions received. All right, so that, that's the community engagement. Any questions about community engagement? All right. Moving on, so we'll do a quick update for the Northwest BRT. So on the left side of the screen here, you've got the, um, uh, the corridor. Again, you know, connecting downtown all the way to Northwest Expressway and Meridian. Um, you know, our, our main corridor there being Classen and Northwest Expressway. A few quick uh, talking points about the uh, corridor. So it's eight miles one way or 16 miles round trip. We've got 32 stops along the corridor. And then, you know, just to add a little more detail to our 32 stops, the majority of those stops are set up as couplets, right? So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for our riders to be able to, um, to use the system. So what, what the couplet system means is, so as you're riding the bus and you get to your stop, you get off and you uh, take care of whatever business you need to take care of. Whenever you come back, you're easily able to find your return stop, right? So it's either going to be directly across the street or... Uh, uh, directly diagonal from the stop that you use to get to, to where you're going, trying to make it intuitive for our riders. Uh, we'll have three park and ride locations. So those park and ride locations again are <coughs> Northwest Expressway and Meridian. Uh, we'll have a park and ride location at Northwest Expressway and Penn. And we're also gonna have a park and ride lo location at our Century Center parking garage. So that Century Center parking garage is you know, directly diagonal from our BRT stop that's at um, Broadway and Maine. And one that we're really, really excited about is 20% uh, of the region's jobs are within a half mile of our alignment. So, I mean, that's huge, right? So that's that's huge trip generator for us. We're looking forward to, to, uh, to being able to connect all those jobs to uh, everyone's homes. And then part of this project's uh, main goals is making sure that we're improving access for cyclists and pedestrians. So this project will be installing bike lanes from uh, Northwest 10th and Classen to Northwest 16th Street in Classen. Uh, but uh, another thing that we're really, really excited about is we're improving pedestrian access, right? So anywhere where we're building stops and the uh, intersection isn't meeting ADA access, 
we're going back and we're making sure that those curb ramps and those uh, uh, crossings meet ADA access, including um, audible signals uh, at the at those intersections. And then we're also uh, anywhere where we're putting a stop, we're making sure that that stop has sidewalk access to the nearest intersection. So again, improving access for cyclists and pedestrians. And then improving uh, access to healthcare, grocery stores, and shopping, right? So this, this corridor uh, goes through pretty uh, uh, expansive area with grocery stores and healthcare, hitting Integris, uh, uh, St. Anthony's Hospital, uh, Buy for Less up on Northwest Expressway, and several small grocery stores along uh, Classen and the Expressway. So we're super, super excited about our corridor here. Now I want to talk through the amenities of our platforms real quick. So similar to like our streetcar uh, stations, every one of our BRT platforms will have a uh, shelter with lighting and bench and ADA access. Um, every one of our platforms will at a minimum have one bike rack, uh, but we're shooting to have two at every one of our platforms. Uh, the only reason we would only have one is if there's a space constraint. Uh, again, thinking about that multi multi-modality, right? So pedestrians, cyclists, and uh, being able to make access to, to the platforms. Talk a little bit about the ticket vending machines. So similar to our uh, OKC streetcar ticket vending machines, we'll have ticket vending machines at our uh, BRT platforms. Every BRT platform will have a trash can with lock. And then um, one, one of the things I'm most excited about is we're gonna have additional lighting at our platforms, right? So we wanna make sure that our platforms are inviting to our customers. So we're gonna be installing not just lighting at our shelters, but we're also going to be installing additional lighting uh, near, near the platform, lighting the way to the platform. And then finally, our next arrival and info informational pylon. So this is just a, a schematic of what that pylon could look like. We're anticipating that our pylon is going to look just like our OKC streetcar, but rebranded to, to match the Northwest BRT. Uh, it's going to be very similar to our OKC streetcar pylon where there'll be a, a monitor built into the pylon where you can uh, see when the next three buses are going to arrive at that uh, platform, but also have an opportunity for advertisement at that platform. Hey, Jesse, while yep. you're on the slide, can I ask a, a question? So where the bike racks are, um, especially where it, under the words additional lighting. Uh -huh. um, can can you just check and, and make sure when the engineers are looking at that, that that's not obstructing where the streetcar, I mean, the bus doors will open. It, it concerns me that, see the red line in there, that maybe that is too close to where the doors are opening. It'll be difficult for someone on a wheelchair get uh, around there. Sure. Yeah, we'll double check that. Um, so in, in the slide here, this, so yep. this is all the truncated domes that run along the edge. This yellow section here is where the doors for the, the BRT bus will open. Good. Okay. We will, we're maintaining the ADA access between the, the edge of the domes and the leaning rail, which is right, right there. Right. And okay. then that bike rack is behind it, but we'll, we'll double and triple check all the uh, clearances. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And then this is uh, our high capacity platform. So instead of that one shelter, we'll have uh, a double shelter there with the uh, double benches, double ADA uh, refuge area there. So we're anticipating having these at our Northwest 23rd and Classen stop, and then also at our um, Northwest Expressway and Meridian stop. So we, we see this as a, a huge benefit for our, at our Northwest Expressway and 23rd uh, I'm sorry, class and 23rd stop, because with our Route 23, we, we've got several routes that run through there. And so we kind of see that intersection as a, a connecting point between our uh, fixed route and our Northwest BRT. Uh, so we kind of see that as a transfer point also, but we want to make sure that we have plenty of room for our customers that may be waiting. Same amenities for our high capacity platforms. So I won't spend any time on that. Um, I'm going to jump into our schedule. So uh, back in October, we wrapped up our 30% design and uh, kind of walking through the schedule real quick. So we've had several workshops, our, uh, our community outreach, um, but we're moving toward our 60% design in July. Um, and then after we receive our 60% design, we'll start our utility uh, relocation and right-of-way acquisition uh, process. So we're 
we want to make sure that we've really nailed down where those stations are going to go because we've kind of been shifting them around a little bit, trying to avoid some utilities and, and things like that. But with our 60% design, once we receive that, our, our station locations are essentially locked in. Uh, and like I said, we'll reach out to all the different utility companies along the, the right of way in the corridor, making sure that if any of those ut utilities need to be moved, we start that process early. Uh, and then we anticipate our 95% design in October. Uh, after we receive our 95% design, we'll be sending that out to a few peer groups, um, such as you know Kansas City, uh, where they've just brought online their Prospect Max. So we'll be sending that 95% design for a, a peer review. And then between 95% and our 100% design, we'll be finalizing that design. And then we'll uh, internally, we'll go through a process where we uh, take a look at uh, any value engineering um, opportunities that we could have and, and to have those in our back pocket just in case uh, the project comes in slightly over budget. Uh, with the uh, anticipated uh, submittal of our 100% design in January, we'll be bringing that 100% design to the board for approval to, to launch into our bid advertisement. And once it goes out on the street for bid advertisement, uh, we'll receive those bids. We'll start a, a contract with our uh, construction contractor. We anticipate our construction start date to be around June of 2022. And then about a year long process of construction with our construction completion being July of 2023. And during that whole construction process, you know, we'll be doing our construction inspections where we're going out and making sure that our ADA cross slopes and uh, uh, ramp slopes all meet the, uh, the requirement. And then between July of 2023 and October of 2023, when we start revenue service, we'll be doing our construction and conformance testing, our safety acceptance. So this is similar to like what we did with the, the OKC streetcar, where we'll be, you know, taking the bus out and making sure that the bus can properly pull up to the platform and still be able to maintain that uh, level boarding that our buses will have and between the, the bus and the platform be able to maintain that ADA clearance. Uh, and then right before we go into revenue service, we'll go through a 30 day period of uh, essentially uh, mock revenue service where our operators will be going out, uh, running the route just like they would once we go into service, just to verify that there's no issues uh, that we need to mitigate prior to going into service. And that wraps up the, the BRT update. Be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Good report, Jesse. Thank you. Any questions by any of the trustees? All right, then I would have a motion to approve item F. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Jesse. Um, just real quick, <clears throat> and I've already spoken with Jason about this. Well, first, thank you for the kind words uh, earlier. Um, with, great, with great power comes great responsibility, they say in the philosophy world of Spider-Man. Um, <clears throat> the, the crosswalks are something that have been more on my mind a lot lately. And <clears throat> when, <clears throat> and I know we're heading in that continental crosswalk direction, which is great. Will we get to see any of that? Because like when I do a Google search of continental crosswalks, it actually brings up like a, there's like a variation, right? And in my mind, I think very specifically like what's going on around Scissortel. Like it just, those are huge. It, yep. Scissortel, Omni, that tells, that just tells everyone down there like pedestrians priority here. And that's where we're heading. Will we, uh, will we get to see any of that ahead of that implementation to kind of get a good sense of, of, of where along the route those crosswalks will exist and the, their width and their length and these, well, I guess length is different. But anyway, you yeah. get what you're saying. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. So yeah, um, typically what we do is uh, with the 65% drawings, we could, we could bring that to the board and provide an update. We can have HNTB uh, provide that update and we'll make sure that they uh, detail what that continental crossing looks like. Uh, I'll tell you right now that the, the plan is to match essentially what we're doing downtown. That's essentially the new OKC standard. And so we'd be matching that with our BRT project. So the, the continental striping will be, you know, the, the real uh, heavy and bold white striping with 
and, and nice and deep to make sure that we allow plenty of room for pedestrians to be able to cross. Absolutely. And then three other, three, three people can join me. We can recreate the Abbey Road cover together. I love it. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the motion, motion passes to approve item F. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda is ratification of payroll and vendor claims for the period April 6th through April 27th. Uh, if there's no questions from any of the trustees, then I'd have a motion to ratify. Somebody want to make a motion? <laughs> Can we have everybody do it uh, verbally, please? Sure, I'll move it. This is Steve. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All of those in favor, do we need to do that verbally? Yes. Aye. Barney, aye. Laura, aye. Meg, I. James, I. Steve, I. James. Oh, sorry, I thought I said I, but I again. <laughs> All right, motion passes. Our financial reports is copy the schedules of revenue and expenditures. Uh, budget to actual for the month ended March 31st. Any comments on that, Jason, that you'd like to make? <clears throat> Jason. Jason, you're muted. Yep, sorry about that. Um, yeah, if I can, I'll just keep my comments to um, the transportation, the parking, and the streetcar uh, budget to actual, and happy to answer any questions, of course, on any, any of the reports. But looking at page two on our transportation operations, um, if I could direct your attention to the revenues, um, the about halfway down the list of revenues, you'll see the FTA CARES reimbursement. Um, you'll show that You'll, you'll see it's about 360,000 less than what we had estimated. Um, just as a reminder to the trust, we um, request that reimbursement as we have the expenses. So we've actually just had a few less expenses than what we um, you know, had projected um, earlier on in the year when we put the budget together. So um, by, by not you know, having the expenses and having to draw the CARES money, it just extends that CARES money longer. We don't lose any of it. So um, it's not any variance uh, in my mind to be alarmed about it all. Um, and then if I could direct you to the expenditures, um, you'll see, as I've mentioned in past months, we, we are continuing to exceed our budget on personal services. We're projected to be about 300 and, or I'm sorry, through, um, through March, we're 342,000 over what we had uh, budgeted, or about 2.4%. Um, of course, um, we've seen a lot of savings in the payments to the City of Oklahoma City Transportation Fund that offsets that, along with savings from fuel. Um, on the uh, other services and fees, you'll notice it's 154,000. Um, over through nine months of the fiscal year. Um, we actually have two months worth of chargebacks recorded in March that are affecting that number a little bit. So we basically kind of prepaid for some of the services that we received from IT and all the other administrative re uh, support we received from the city. So with all that said, um, if you compare total revenues to total expenditures, um, our expenditures exceed our revenues by about $107,000. Um, but again, um, 
we're really closer to pretty much break even if um, we wouldn't have paid for a couple of months of chargebacks at, at one time. So um, anyway, that is a summary of where we're at with transportation operations. Um, on parking, I think the main thing I wanted to just remind the trust is if you look at the revenues, we're showing to be about a million, uh, well, let's say 1,286,000 under uh, budget. Well, keep in mind in April um, last month, um, the trust took action to amend the parking budget to align our actual revenues that we're receiving, or I'm sorry, to align our budget closer to the actual revenues that we're receiving. So if you'll remember, and I'm summarizing that budget amendment, but we lowered the revenues, the overall budget by 1,272,000. So if you're in next, next month, you'll see this, but just wanted to remind the trust that even though you see that, that deficit, um, it actually, our, our revenues as of March are actually pretty close to what we had, the amended budget would reflect. Um, keeping in mind too, just again, as a reminder, part of that budget amendment added some of our reserves to the operating budget to support our, um, our operations, because we it is likely that we will actually incur more expenses than revenue um, during this fiscal year. And I know, I know I've mentioned that several times already, but it's not typical that we experience that on parking. So I feel compelled to continue to repeat that because um, it, it is kind of an outlier. Um, so with that, uh, moving on down to the expenditure section of the um, budget to actual for parking, um, I direct your attention to footnote number two there, where basically um, looking at parking garage operations, even though uh, at this point in time, we show to have a 577,000 positive variance, we still have expenses for February and March that are not reflected in this financial. So that's about an additional 250,000 in expenses for um, services rendered in those two months that um, is not reflected here. And um, again, that's just, you know, we as staff, we thoroughly review those invoices we receive from Republic. Um, typically we don't pay until we have all of the backup justification for you know, everything that's included in that billing. And it just takes a little while to get through it. Um, I know Corey, um, Corey meets with Republic every month to go through the invoicing and um, the monthly operating report. I, I attend um, some of those as well, but we are um, looking to try to figure out a way to expedite that payment process. And then finally, um, streetcar operations on page, um, seven of your financial. Um, again, um, probably just direct your attention to um, the expenditure um, outliers here, if you will. Um, all the expenditure categories that you see are showing to be um, under budget through um, nine months of the fiscal year with the exception of streetcar operations. And um, again, we've got a, a, foot, a footnote there. Um, um, advising the trust that the invoices for streetcar actually paid all the way through uh, February. Uh, we do anticipate an additional 325 of expenses uh, for March's services that Herzog provides. Um, so with that, uh, if you compare total revenues to, to total expenses, we show to be 399,000 to the positive. Uh, but again, if you were to drop in another 325,000 of expenses, we'd really be, you know, a lot closer to more of a break-even type position. Mm -hmm. So um, all in all, um, transit and streetcar operating, you know, in positive territory. Uh, we've talked about parking, how we're probably going to be operating and finishing at a bit of a deficit this year and having to use some reserves. Happy to answer any other questions. All right. Any questions? Uh, item B is the, to receive the corrected COPTA Employment Retirement Trust interim financial statements. And Mr. Chairman, we have uh, Amy Lucas from the city's accounting department um, on the in the meeting today just to 
briefly, very briefly, just let you know what the correction was. Okay. Amy, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good morning. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. Yes, we had, um, when we actually saved the last document for publishing after it had gone through the review process, one of the Excel um, cells got voided out. And so on page five of the first financial set you got, the dividends for the prior year year were deleted out on that copy that we saved. So the only difference is this is we've put back in the dividends. And so now your net position ties all the way through. But that was for the two, the 2020 numbers were good. It was just an error on the prior year numbers that we wanted to get corrected and have the right ones on file. Any questions? Any questions any of the trustees? All right, thank you. Thank you. Then I would have a motion to uh, receive our financial reports, A and B. Uh, we have a motion and a second, all in favor? Uh, motion passes, thank you. I think, Jason, we have what one program report, marketing and technology, and Michael's going to give us that report? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Thanks for uh, allowing me a chance to share a few of the updates from our marketing and IT team. Um, I first want to start with uh, some of the things that we've been going on with our Norman service, so Embark Norman. Uh, in Embark uh, Norman, you know, we first focused our year uh, around building our infrastructure of operations, our routine there, uh, as well as assessing our infrastructure needs. Uh, and as we approach the end of our second year, if you can believe it, this August, uh, I want to take a moment to recognize a few related accomplishments. So our marketing team developed, uh, you know, new comprehensive system maps, service guides, as well as uh, the installation of 117 new bus stops signs in Norman. Uh oh. You think you've got it right. It's okay, Michael. You can't get anything past Tisha. She, she's awesome. <laughs> Is this better? There we go. So glad we have our our help, <laughs> uh, friends and colleagues to help us out there. All right. So we've uh, also established uh, system new system apps here in Norman. Uh, the bus stop signs. Uh, but also want to just recognize a few things others have done because uh, there, there's been a lot to take place. Marilyn's team, as you know, she's she leads a great team of professionals, but they have overhauled the entire paratransit application eligibility process for the City of Norman's program. And this was a huge undertaking. And we we're so grateful for all the time and effort, extra time and effort that they put into that uh, to get it up to the same standards in which we're operating here in Oklahoma City. I also want to recognize Jeff Wheatley and his staff. Jeff is our operations specialist there in Norman, and he's done a fantastic job of uh, mm -hmm. building a good team around us uh, that have also, you know, had to navigate a series of, 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 of different issues, you know, as well as the pandemic. But we've uh, had to move our transfer center uh, due to uh, the operations on game days. And uh, we've also had some extreme weather. So they've, they've just taken that in stride and done a phenomenal job. Uh, Mike Shaw has done a, a phenomenal job as well. He helped guide uh, the city of Norman uh, through their very first random FTA audit, and it was over drug and alcohol testing and procedures. So they successfully navigated that and was able to uh, help the city of Norman with that. 
And of course, our planning team, you know, Chip Nolan, uh, nothing uh, that comes out of his office is, uh, has any question about it. It's, it's such a good quality and they've helped the city of Norman in its first NTD submittal. As you know, those are all really detailed things that have to be done and submitted and, they, and they've done that without any, uh, any problems. Uh, of course, you know, we, we've got to make sure that all the accounting is taken care of in regards to our expenses and the invoicing. And Lee Rush and his team have done a very good job of meticulously wading through all of those things and making sure that those are on time and done as they should be. And, you know, these are just a few of the accomplishments. There are many more. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff. They've got an operations building and facility that's under construction right now. Uh, and we also have had award-winning operators this last year uh, who've competed in competitions and, and they've done a great job. So we're really proud of the effort that we've seen uh, take place there. But one of the uh, things that has come up that has really uh, been an important feature for us is the new Embark Norman Real-Time. Our IT team has successfully guided and implemented the AVL system on all its vehicles. And uh, working alongside our partners at the city of Norman, the system provides real-time service information to all of the customers that are using that system. And so uh, this uh, also provides operational insights for our operations team, and it overall improves the customer experience. You know, predictability is vital in public transportation, and this is one of those tools that can help us provide that predictability and thus reliability. A really fun project that we've been working on this, uh, this uh, spring is we were approached by the University of Oklahoma to uh, allow Embark to be the subject of its capstone project for its marketing and advertising students in the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communications. And these students are paired into three teams of nine and are competing for the, they have a prized media plan that they do as part of their capstone class every year. And our Embark marketing team will visit their campus this afternoon to hear their presentations and score uh, the presentations and then announce the winner. You know, the capstone focuses on proprietary research, uh, strategic positioning, creative ideation, recommendations, media planning, uh, and so that whole gamut of media and marketing strategies uh, that are multiple touch points for our customers. And so they're going to provide us a new uh, kind of view of how they see it as young college students entering uh, the workforce and being community leaders, uh, future community leaders. Uh, so we're really looking forward to engaging with them this afternoon. And we expect that we will definitely learn a lot. Uh, real quick, I just want to thank uh, you and uh, for those who were able to attend on April 22nd, we hosted our Earth Day media conference uh, to celebrate the opening of our CNG fueling facility and the launch of our state-of-the-art uh, fixed route public transit bus. That's uh, the first electric vehicle uh, bus, public transit bus in the state. So it's pretty exciting to get to be the first there. But of course, we couldn't have done that without our project manager, Dennis Fry, and of course, the mayor and his office for being there, and the Department of Public Works who helped us in the project management, uh, and many others. We, we really appreciate it. And those who were able to attend, you know, of course, you made it extra special uh, just being there and being a part of that uh, celebration. We've had a really good response uh, from the media and the so on social media just about these efforts, uh, and they're very proud to see that we're making these types of investments. So thank you to our board. Uh, for prioritizing that and making that a strategic initiative. As you know, every year we do quite a bit of research. And so we are wrapping that up. Um, uh, we wrap that up this fall and we've got the reports coming in. And this uh, coming uh, summer, uh, just at the next meeting, you'll hear from Chris Tatham, the ETC uh, president, about uh, the full findings of this, uh, this research. Uh, they're also gonna take a moment to present at the following city council meeting on June 8th. But real quick, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I think is uh, really important in regards to the year that we were operating in and then the year in which they did the surveys for our onboard uh, uh, surveys for our customers. And so something that they, you know, that really stood out to me is this, these questions that all revolved around safety. And as you know, this last year, there was an enhanced uh, focus on safety. 
And, you know, in some years, you and in some cases, you might even expect that people's expectations and perceptions might have really gone up. And uh, thus, the ratings might have gone down because we, we couldn't have met them. But I know that we can applaud our staff and frontline employees because they made our customers feel safe. We've got exceptionally high ratings, especially in a year like we all experience. Uh, so to be up in the 80 percentile rating for safety, safety uh, in regards to how you feel, uh, and a lot of that can be uh, very subjective. And so we're really proud of the, the work that our team has done. And I think it just speaks again to the commitment to, to put our customers and their safety uh, as a priority. And uh, it's a top of mind for them. And again, you will be hearing more from them, Mr. Uh, Tatham next month. Uh, and I think you're going to like what you hear. Another uh, tool that's brand new to us this year, and we can share a link with you if you want, but this is a, an, a dashboard that is now available. This is the first time we've ever had this. And this, uh, with this tool, we're able to quickly uh, and quantitatively examine the relationships between many variables. Uh, so we're really excited about having this tool. They also added past years uh, of survey data to it. So it allows us to take a look at past trends and uh, also try to use it to forecast where we're going. Uh, one of the things that we have been working on is the EmbarkOK.com. As you know, last year, uh, last fall uh, specifically, uh, the pandemic was, uh, was unkind to a lot of businesses. Uh, and as a result, we had to move our contract for this web development to another vendor uh, because they uh, did not survive that, that um, the, the economic, uh, downturn. But as a result, we've been able to get started and we're using this time uh, to also reestablish uh, the project and get it going and making sure that all the focuses are where they should be. We've learned a lot over the last year in regards to how uh, we need to operate and what tools and systems we need to communicate with our customers. Mm -hmm. So that insight's allowing us to, uh, to build that into this website as we continue to move forward. Uh, just as a reminder, our staff uh, that we're currently managing seven different websites and uh, platforms. So the new design we create will have efficiencies and have updated planning, trip planning tools, as well as a, an updated customer experience, especially for those in the mobile environment only. Jesse mentioned earlier uh, that the BRT uh, system and the planning and the uh, all of that project is moving along quite rapidly. And we're going to continue to see development on uh, that in regards to our branding. Uh, we met earlier uh, or late last month uh, to talk about the branding for the new bus rapid transit system. And we're excited about the work that Cookcom, uh, our communications partner, is doing. Uh, we've asked them to help us develop a comprehensive brand strategy that will establish a foundation for multiple for the multiple phases of the project. So as you know, there's this engineering time where a lot of public input is, in, is requested. Then we go into construction and there's a lot of relationships that we have to continue to manage there. And then as we go into the uh, launch of the system, we will then focus messaging uh, appropriately towards gaining ridership. So they're helping us with that messaging as we go through each of those different stages. Staff anticipates public revealing the name and mark uh, later uh, uh, in this early summer uh, period, June or July. I, I know that we've been given, giving you updates over the last uh, few months on the continued development of real-time information for our streetcar system. <clears throat> as you know, uh, you know, our exclusive partner, US Fleet Tracking, they've been working with us to enhance that experience for our customers. So we've recently launched just a few weeks ago, having real-time maps on each of the streetcar platforms. So this allows you not only to see when the arrival times are coming, but it also allows you to see the uh, where the vehicle is located so you can make a judgment about uh, where the car is and which car is coming next. So we're excited about that and we continue uh, to also make up updates to the system. Uh, one of those is uh, allowing some back office abilities to push service notices and schedule those in advance and create some efficiencies for our staff. Finally, I just wanted to give you a, a small glimpse of something that we've just started to, uh, working on. Uh, we have recently, uh, we had some change in staff early, uh, late last fall. So one of our team members moved to Colorado 
And so when we replaced that position, we added uh, someone who has a different skill set than what we've had before. So we're just getting started, uh, brand new here, but we're glad to welcome uh, Lloyd Rosen, Rosen to our uh, team. And he brings specifically uh, that visual storytelling uh, experience. And so I was going to show you just a few things he's done here. To, you know, to find someone to take you to the store. Uh, just, you know, like I said, I'm not able to walk far, you know, to ride the metro bus. I mean, I thought, you know, being a small store, they would kind of have the price a little bit higher, but it wasn't. It really wasn't. Right here to make sure. Well, I set it up, you just call, uh, call the office and uh, let them know that you want to uh, be picked up. It's, it's going to be a big help. This is our final video here.
So again, we're really excited about having that opportunity to uh, start telling more stories with the, in that visual format. And I'm glad to answer any questions you might have at this point. Thank you for your patience in my presentation. Michael, thank you. Nice presentation. Uh, any what, questions uh, for Michael? Yes, what is that YouTube channel? Yeah, so Embark OK we, is our YouTube channel. And of course, we can share any of this with you that you'd like. And if uh, you have partners that would be uh, open to it, we'd be glad to share any B-roll that we capture. That was some quick turnaround on the Cinco de Mayo Festival there. <laughs> Fun content. <laughs> have a motion to receive our program reports. Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion passes. All right. Uh, that's the end of our agenda, other than any items from any of the trustees. Before I get to Jason, we missed him at the last, last month's meeting. And, and, uh, so we'll, we'll let him continue this, this meeting. Any comments, Jason? Yes, sir. Um, I mean, I didn't get to make any last month, so of course have something for this month. Although <clears throat> I understand we stretch this meeting out a little bit longer than April's. I just can't compete with uh, Suzanne and her efficiency. But um, anyway, here we are. A um, couple things. Um, I did uh, want to congratulate all those involved in the Cinco de Mayo Festival. I know um, Trustee Ruiz had a huge role uh, in that. And um, as part of, um, you know, our, I guess, support, if you will, of that, um, that event in terms of parking, I wanted to let the trustees know that we actually had um, 850 uh, parking customers in that surface lot that we just approved the lease for on Saturday and another 718 parkers on Sunday. So, you know, the idea of that being the scissor tail surface lot to serve events at the park, um, apparently it has caught on. I um, also want to recognize the MAPS office uh, for um, their ability, urgency to get that turned over to us so we could offer that parking. Um, to the residents and visitors to the Cinco de Mayo. And then the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, you know, Michael had shared some survey results of um, basically feelings of safety uh, from our customers, uh, particularly some measures uh, specific to COVID um, safety precautions on our transit services. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to recognize and thank the trust for um, you know, declare, uh, passing a resolution, declaring an emergency, um, you know, when, when the pandemic was upon us and allowed, you know, me as the administrator, a lot of flexibility um, so that our organization can be nimble and quick to respond. And um, I mean, we, we just wouldn't have been able to create the same safe as we could environment um, without the trust uh, support. So um, y'all, you know, the trustees played a huge role in that. And I just wanted to recognize, um, mention that too. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. All right. Uh, no other comments than I guess we heard at the beginning of the meeting, our June meeting will be in person at city council. So I look forward to seeing everybody then. And if there's no other comments, our meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>